Look, wonderful to be here. First time um, in Estonia, so it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. It's a little colder uh, than San Francisco, um, but I think that's better, right, because you spend all the time indoors coding. I think that might be the secret to the, uh, the Estonian economy, is it's too cold to do anything else. <laughs> Look, um, wonderful to be here. Um, I want to kind of um, start off um, this talk talking about complexity. And I think the fact is we live in an incredibly complex world that's difficult for us as humans to understand. But the fact is, as humans, as individuals, as organizations, we still have to make decisions within this. And these decisions can often have profound consequences. But the complexity that we, we confront and the cognitive limitations that we have in the human brain mean that we're looking at opposing directions. So we're not going to make decisions in the future with the human brain alone. The complexity of the world is simply too high. We're going to have to use machines to help augment our intelligence, to amplify the way that we think, and to change the complexity of what we can actually understand. So this is what we're doing at Primer. We're now 45 people in San Francisco. Um, we've been working for three years to help build machines to help us accelerate our understanding of the world. And we do this by focusing on building machines that can read and write. And reading and writing is core to intelligence. It allows us to observe the world, to understand what's being said, to find insights from that, but importantly, to communicate those back so that we can learn something from the machines as they observe the world for us. What does that mean? Concretely, it means monitoring every single thing that's ever been written, consistently as it's written, taking it from a diverse range of data sources, from scientific papers to social media, to understand it, to understand what's being said, to understand what's not being said, to understand how it agrees and how it disagrees, and to combine that together into a set of insights that can find and summarize the world around us so that we humans can start at a higher level. In short, we're automating the generation of intelligence to give humans a leg up in understanding the complexity of the world that we live in. So we've deployed this now to a number of customers um, in a number of different sectors. These are an example of a few of them. GIC uh, is one of the biggest sovereign wealth funds in the world, hundreds of billions of dollars, and it's no uh, exaggeration to say they literally own a percent of everything in the world. Walmart has 2.4 million people. They do nearly half a trillion dollars of revenue. A huge, complex ecosystem that they involve is bigger than, uh, almost bigger than, well, it is bigger than this country. <laughs> It's almost bigger than New Zealand, which is a, a sort of, you know, on, on the scale of things. And then IQT, um, which is the, uh, the corporate arm of the US intelligence agencies. And you look at the job that they have in front of them is to understand the geopolitical structure of the world, literally everything that unfolds in the world. And so we deploy software to each of these different organizations and many more to help them understand their world so that they can make better decisions within it. Now, these seem like very different types of companies and very different organizations, but they all share one thing in common, and that's too much data and not enough people. And this is kind of summed up by this graph. We can look at data, which we've actually done a really good job of collecting over the past five years. We've done a really good job of getting data, and it's been growing exponentially. But the number of people that we have to interpret and understand this data is at best kind of moving linearly. And what this means is there's a delta between the information that we have and should be looking at and the information that we actually are looking at. And that delta represents an intelligence gap that can be crucial. And if you're in the intelligence sector, that delta can mean the difference between literally life and death. Now, we're not going to solve this by throwing more people at the problem. It's just simply not economical, and we also run up against cognitive limitations in the type of data and the dimensionality and complexity of the data that we deal with. We're going to have to automate this solution. What does that mean? What does it look like concretely? We can see our system running. We can put 41,000 documents here about cryptocurrency through it. And if you were an analyst looking at that, your world might look something like this. Uh, Will you start looking at that data? And this is your day. Um, it may not be uh, particularly glamorous, but this is your job. <laughs> and it looks kind of like crazy, right? Like, you know, how would anyone do this? But this is what thousands of analysts do every day, all day. <laughs> And what we try and do is say, well, can we automate this to figure out if we put together a briefing about cryptocurrency, what would it look like? And so we're able to train our system to read a lot of analyst reports to figure out what's actually interesting and figure out how to express it back to the user. So we look at here is actually the output from um, machine-generated output from Primer. This is run actually back in October of last year. 
And you can see the main event that it calls out there is the regulation of Bitcoin uh, by the Russian uh, government. And actually the net result of the price moving, about $600 drop after the, the information of regulation emerging. It also highlighted, obviously, the bubble that was coming through, uh, people selling their house to buy Bitcoin, as well as a hedge fund that was raising $500 million to invest in Bitcoin, and the audacious claim that it picked out that Bitcoin would indeed go above $10,000, which seemed preposterous back in October, but the system actually surfaced that. And in addition, it shows the comments by J Jamie, Morgan out of J uh, sorry, Jamie Dimon out of JP Morgan looking at the, perhaps, um, the, 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 the impact that it might have on the traditional financial system. So you can generate a briefing in natural language highlighting the major things that are unfolding from a huge range of documents, and this becomes a starting point that analysts can then work with. Now, of course, you can get more detail. So you can dive into an event here around the regulation of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. You can see here the summary that's generated. You can see the key people and the quotes. It also puts together a map highlighting Moscow and also Sochi. Sochi being important because that's where the Russian minister made the comments at a conference with uh, Vladimir Putin around the regulatory environment there. So really good detail kind of coming out as well as the high level scope. And what drives this is a set of core analytic engines that we've developed at Primer over the past three years. And these allow us to reconfigure different techniques to start replicating different functions of analysts. So we've got engines like structuring data, finding events, ensemble engines that bring together data to try and understand what it means in aggregate, context engines, difference engines that look for differences between data, and also the story generation engines, which allow us to communicate that back to users. So I'd like to kind of run through a few of these and see how they work and, and get a sense of what's going on with them. So the structure engine is the first engine that's generally applied to these documents. It allows us to take a document that's uh, just general text and start to find structure that is innate within it. So of course you can take a sentence like this, almost 57,000 Model S vehicles. You can find the number, but you can also find the units and the modifier. So it starts to get this kind of structure that you can work with. If you're looking for people, you can take a, a, a list of documents. You can find the people, obviously, but you can also find the affiliations and how you would best describe them. Um, it's kind of interesting, uh, you know, Larry Page gets here, CEO of Alphabet and the other Google uh, co-founder, um, which I think is a, a nice way of referring to Larry <laughs> as it goes through. So you can pull that out, and this isn't coming from a knowledge repository, this is being generated from the text that's underlying that. Once you've got this, you've got a bit of a fingerprint of the document, and that document can now be compared to all sorts of other documents. Once you've done that, you can identify things like events, and the event here is uh, being identified. Um, back uh, the, 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 uh, the rumor that Apple is rumored to be building a, a self-driving car, you can see that there are 613 documents that give evidence for this event. We can classify this as a rumor, and we can also identify that it's a geolocation in Sunnyvale, California. So you can identify this as an event, classify it, um, find all the different bits of evidence for it, and then you can put this through into the Ensemble engine. And the Ensemble engine takes the fact that information is never just kind of existing by itself, it exists with a lot of repetition sometimes. So you look at a set of sentences and it can identify these, um, this time talking about the number of people purportedly working on the car. And you can see here all the different estimates from 550 to more than 600. And you can start to say, look, we think these are all talking about the same thing. Um, and indeed, we can find the best, uh, the best representation and the mean point estimate of it. In this case, uh, the, the number there of, of 600 people working on the project. Um, in addition, um, you can find where there's consensus. So you can apply um, engines to look at stance detection to find consensus. In this case, people agreeing that 2019 is a good date uh, to release the car, as well as um, uh, putting it together the 2020 date there. And then you can find contradictions. So looking for things that disagree with us. And this is an interesting problem in language of stars detection, looking for agreement and disagreement between sentences and claims. So this is, again, if you're an analyst, very, very important to know supporting evidence and to know contradictory evidence. The other thing that I really like is it's able to go down and chase the long tail of information. So as an analyst, if you're sitting there and trying to understand all this information from 617 different documents, you literally would have to read every single one of them in, in their entirety to pick up this key bit of information that, that actually Apple has developed new technologies that allows for 35% greater battery capacity. And this is key. If you're an analyst, this may make a difference between deciding whether or not this is a real and significant event or it's a rumor. And so being able to pull this out from the one document which it emerges from, surface it up to the user, 
is a huge, huge help for the analysts that are working in this space. With regards to context, events happen, but they don't happen in isolation. They have things that happen before them, and they have things that happen afterwards. As an analyst, your job is to pull that thread and kind of connect things back together. So with the context engine, you can do just that. That allows you to take an event here that it's identified, uh, the Model S, to get software update to version 7.0 to enhance the semi-autonomous driving capabilities. So that event is identified, and then a week later, another event is identified that it tends to drift off highways. Um, two weeks after that, uh, we, we get another event. Uh, Tesla wants to prevent idiots from killing themselves. It's a reasonable event. But what's interesting is that two months after that, we see another event here that GM is delaying its Super Cruise self-driving technology on the Cadillac CT6. Now, in isolation, you might read this event as an analyst and not really understand its significance. But knowing that it's connected back to the troubles that Tesla had with its self-driving technology allows you to understand that perhaps it might be a little bit longer before General Motors releases theirs. The difference engine allows you to take any two corpuses of information and compare them. So these can be two different uh, types of news. It can be social versus uh, mainstream media. It can be trade publications versus financial press. Or it can be two different corpuses of information uh, in, in terms of languages. Um, in this case here, we can uh, look at all the different uh, documents working in Russian um, about self-driving cars, and we can identify all the events in Russian. So we do that, and, and there'll actually be some Russian speakers here, which is unusual for, uh, for, for, for the audiences I normally address. So you'll see the, uh, the events there, and if you don't um, speak Russian, you'll see the translations of those events. So it's gone through, identified all the events in Russian media about self-driving cars, and there's some interesting ones. And if you show this to an audience that only looks at English language, they'll look through that and see some things that obviously aren't there. Now, what we can do is identify the events that happen only in Russian and don't have a corollary in English. And so it's really fascinating to kind of see some of those come through, particularly um, uh, talking about some of the, uh, the events that are happening vis-a-vis -vis China. So we're able to take these two different corpuses, identify events, and then compare across them to see events that happen in one area and not another. Now, the interesting thing on top of this is that about only 50% of the events in Russian language media have an English translation. They, only 50% of the events actually find their way across into the English space. And what we find is consistently across languages, information doesn't traverse very well. Only about half of the information finds its way across. And so this allows you to start uncovering those things um, that aren't there. Now, if you're in finance, information not transmitting between languages is a very, very interesting arbitrage opportunity um, if you can start to spot it. So the story engine coming out of this allows you to put all these insights together to start to generate natural language outputs. And those things um, are, are really you know, what people like. They like the technology on some level, um, but they really like just to be able to read something, understand it, and figure out what's happening and what's going on. So what we can do uh, for the intelligence customers and what we do um, is generate these briefings. Um, in this case, it's about Syria. Um, pertaining to Russian language uh, documents talking about Syria. This is obviously unclassified. Uh, you can run it on classified data. And you get the different sections that emerge, and it's trained on every single uh, briefing that has been written um, by the agencies that are with them. So what's actually interesting on this, it actually pulls out some really um, quite uh, interesting insights. Um, so here it talks about one of the significant Russian uh, topics emerging from the data set was about the FSB and, and court cases. It identifies that it was not present in Western media and includes the events about migrants being detained for conspiring to aid ISIS and also seven people being detained in Chechnya for attempting to join ISIS in Syria. Now, again, you're reading this in English, but it's actually all come from Russian. It's identified the events, the topics, the people. It's weighted a significance on top of that, and it's learned how to generate um, the language to output. Now, this is huge because it starts to automate that base layer of intelligence collection um, which frees up a lot of uh, analysts to do a lot of other different things. It can go through and generate people profiles, in this case, um, uh, attempting to learn uh, Wikipedia-style pages. Uh, there's a scientist, Janet Kelso, who didn't have a Wikipedia page, but really should have. Um, and you're seeing all the events uh, being identified from the media out there and all the scientific publications that Janet has put together. And you see the output. And so actually really, really interesting things. Now, the nice thing about this is it continually runs across the entirety of the data system, and anything that changes, it can identify. The thing about um, things like Wikipedia and most knowledge bases is their precision is generally pretty good. But because it requires humans to update them all the time, the recall is terrible. And as you can imagine, the recall is massively biased towards 
white male Americans, um, and that's a problem. So automating these things becomes very interesting. We can also go uh, to the other end of the spectrum, some kinds of things we do with Walmart. Uh, this is Consumer Insights. They type in a, 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 a query and they say, I want to know about uh, frozen foods. And um, it generates back a set of insights, in this case, a one-page uh, briefing about millennials' behavior towards uh, uh, frozen uh, dinners. Um, and we can integrate the sales data. I sort of note that that's not real sales data, but um, so if you're looking to trade on Walmart frozen dinners, that, that's probably not a good idea. But, um, <laughs> But it can integrate that and you get that output and it's there on the laptop or on the phone of the user. Um, one of the things I think is, is very interesting is you can go beyond text. You can tell stories with different kinds of media. In this case, telling stories using language, uh, but also using a visual interaction. So what you see here is, is purely automated. Um, it's reading, in this case, Russian language information about terrorism and also English uh, language media about terrorism. It's identifying events, it's geolocating them, it's finding interesting events to kind of call out, and it's telling you a story as you go through it. So it's one year of data from two languages um, geolocated uh, around the world. So you start looking at that, you see in the red, you see Russian language media um, and the events that it's detected, and in the blue, you see the, uh, the English language. And the first thing that jumps out is, uh, is the Russian language media focused on the, uh, the anniversary of, of the attacks in Beslan. You also see um, a small event in Godfrey, um, uh, in America, talking about a, a teen that was conspiring to, to create a terrorist attack. And there's some stuff down there in, um, in the other parts of the world as well. So as you go through this, it identifies these key events. Um, it, it lays it out. It, it puts together the, uh, the graphics. Um, and you can see things here like the 9-11 attacks, but you can also see the ones that really only had Russian media. In this case, um, the, the attention in Bishkek where there was a suicide bombing on the Chinese embassy. And you know, again, as you show this to people in the West, they say, I never heard of that. And the reason you never heard of it is because we didn't tell a story about it. It was never there, and we can see that it really wasn't there. And as you go through this, you start to see the time evolve and the attacks and the events pertaining to terrorism around the world, and you can see this geographic um, isolation. And I think it's really, really fascinating to think about the stories that we tell and what we choose not to tell. Um, you can see here, uh, it's called out an interesting event, in this case, um, in India, talking about the, uh, the conference there where the, uh, the head um, of the Prime Minister of Afghanistan called out the Pakistani ministers for saying you're aiding and abetting terrorists by letting them hide in your country. And it goes on and it finds um, a bunch of different events. In this case, it finds the event here in uh, in Istanbul, a ter terrible attack in the nightclub. Um, you can see the size of that circle being quite significant. Um, 39 people died there. You can also see another attack. 36 people died in a terrible attack in Baghdad. But you can also see it's much, much smaller in terms of information. And it shows you that the, uh, the, the coverage that we give is definitely not linearly proportional to the number of people that are dying. There's something else at play as it moves through. You can see here the significant Russian language media, in this case being driven by Ukrainian media primarily. Out of Ukraine, um, talking about an event where the uh, people in Kiev were taking the Russians to The Hague to uh, accuse them of war crimes for aiding and abetting terrorism in Crimea. Actually a very, very significant story up there that got both Russian and English coverage. You can see the attacks uh, emerging in London, where a man drove his car and killed a lot of people. Um, that was primarily um, uh, English-driven, not a lot of Russian attention on that. And you can see the continuation of the trial operating inside of The Hague. So as this goes through, um, what emerges, as you can start to see, is a map of the world's attention on terrorism segmented by uh, language. And the story that starts to unfold um, here, the massive attacks in, in, in Manchester, killing people at the, at the concert. As well as that, though, the statements up in, uh, in, in the middle of nowhere in Russia uh, talking about the, uh, the Russian minister's uh, reaction uh, to the, the somewhat better state of terrorism in Russia, or allegedly. So as that goes through, a picture emerges, and it becomes very, very clear that we choose to focus on some events in some languages, and we choose to focus on other events in other languages. And sometimes we collectively come together to focus on both, in this case, the attacks in Barcelona. But I think what emerges from all of this 
is a sense that there's a lot of stuff happening in the world and there's no way for us to process all of it. And so we look to machines to help us get a handle on what's going on, what's interesting, what the stories are, but also what the differences are. And I think as you look at that at the end, one of the things jumps out is that little red dot in the middle of America. A red dot meaning there was a terrorist event that the Russians covered in America that the Americans didn't cover at all. And no one knew what that was. We said, what, what's going on there? It's in Little Rock, Arkansas. And we dove into it and, and, and said this might be a mistake. It wasn't a mistake at all. It was an attack that the Russians classified as terrorism that happened in a nightclub in Little Rock, Arkansas. A number of people were killed. And there was a tweet that went out from the Russian uh, minister saying there was a terrorist attack and Russians may be involved. Turned out it wasn't a terrorist attack at all. It was a gang shooting in a nightclub, and that's the way the US media covered it. But the Russian media decided to call that a terrorist attack. And it poses a sort of an interesting question. You start thinking about this, well, is that real or is that fake? Is it a terrorist attack? What is a terrorist attack? And the language that we use to describe the things that are happening around us, we might want to jump on and say that's fake news. Or we might decide and say it's a different perspective. And it becomes very, very interesting to think about different perspectives versus reality and fake. And you start to see this as this map unfolds. I think what's also interesting is the distinct lack of any attention in South America and Africa. Obviously, there's attacks happening in that all the time, but we don't get exposed to it. It's just simply not on our radar. And we think about the narrowness of the filter bubbles that we operate in. So as you go through that, of course, it naturally leads to computational propaganda, emergence of bots. You can't study Russian or indeed English media these days without understanding the manipulation that goes on behind it. This has been something we've been tracking for a long time. We first saw some of the interesting effects of this back in 2012, and there was a tweet that went out from the Associated Press, breaking two explosions in the White House and Barack Obama is injured. This was fake, of course. It didn't happen. The, the account got hacked. Um, but in some ways, it doesn't matter if it was real or it was fake. The markets decided it was real enough to be uh, instrumental. $130 billion left the market because of this tweet. And you think about that, and it kind of poses, well, what is real and what is fake? If, if this is real, it was a real fake attack. And if it's a real fake attack, then it's real, and the market doesn't care. And so it becomes interesting. Well, we saw that in markets. We saw it also emerge in 2013. This is uh, out of Mexico. And you don't read Spanish. These are a bunch of uh, bots that are tweeting that the journalist that was killed was not killed by a drug cartel, <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> And this is 2013, we saw this going, I thought, well, there's drug cartels in Mexico deploying bots to influence political conversation. This is very interesting. This might actually start becoming much more significant, and of course, um, it was. However, you could still detect these first bots. Like, the time signature wasn't great. The language, yeah, you could, you could pass for human, but the temporal signature became very obvious that these bots would tweet every 15 minutes. So, of course, this was updated when the Chinese got into the game. Um, they got rid of the temporal signatures and the language became more difficult to understand. And you see this evolution of bots that try and become more human-like as they emerge. What, what we're at now is that you can still detect them, but you can't really detect it from language. You can't really detect it from temporality. You can detect it from the networks um, of which they are embedded, from the friends that they have. And you can also detect it from the types of information that they choose uh, to deploy in the sites that they come from. Now, as we know, this had a big impact um, and, and the elections in Brexit, um, a huge amount of uh, divisive tweets going out and, and, and seeding the conversation. It then followed on uh, into the elections in the US. There's a collection of, of tweets that are put out. Um, uh, Trump supporting tweet, uh, bots um, talking about Clinton. Um, you know, without a doubt, that FBI director James Comey covered up Hillary Clinton's lies. The point of these was to create divisive um, commentary. Um, to generate uh, and, and pull apart people in a debate to create an us and a them. And it was very, very successful in doing so. And a huge amount, actually 400,000 bots, um, were estimated to be seeking to manipulate the election, with 20% of all tweets about the election produced by bots. Now, when you look at this, and I think the US is slowly wrapping its head around what to do about this, you're saying, I'm going to take a view of the world and I'm going to seek to manipulate it. I'm going to appreciate that you can't understand the complexity of what's in front of you. So if I put other information in, it's going to start to manipulate your perspective of what's happening. And it turns out we're very manipulable. We are very manipulable as people. And these attacks 
actually created a lot of divisiveness and will continue to do so. But it's very primitive technology. This stuff is not sophisticated by any means. You've literally got people that speak bad English copying and pasting tweets and comments by hand, automating them with some sort of cron job or some sort of software that does that at the cost of a few million dollars a month. And it brought down largely uh, an entire debate in the election cycle in the US. So a hugely asymmetric um, attack vector that yielded um, incredible results. But we're not even getting close to what's possible. You replace those uh, people that are crafting those tweets with machines. Machines can read and write. The machines can write not one, but they can write many. You can write thousands of divisive comments. You can A-B test them to see which ones perform the best. You can personalize them to the individuals. Generated a divisive tweet just for you to manipulate you based on what we think you know and how we think you're going to behave. Instead of randomly dis dispersing them on the most popular, the most recent tweets, we can find attack vectors that take into account the network structure of what's going on. And the technology to understand consensus and opinion formation is advancing massively, so we can think about group opinion formation as, as a potential way of enhancing the capabilities of these technologies. So I say here, look, we're sitting in a world that's more complex than we can understand. We're being manipulated by technologies that are very primitive, but are going to get much more advanced. That's the bad picture. <laughs> But on the other side, we've got machines that can read and can write and can teach us about what's going on in the world, can show us things we haven't seen but probably should see, and can start to do a lot of that groundwork for us. And so I think as we look at the next decade coming forward, we're going to see this battle between manipulation and understanding. And there's going to be some very, very interesting applications of that. And at Prima, we're building machines that can read and write, and we're using that to help people better understand the world in a world that's increasingly being manipulated. And so hopefully we make a little progress on that and absolutely thrilled to be working on it. So uh, thank you for your time and happy to take some questions. <laughs> we, don't have time for we, don't. we don't have time for questions. I'm around. <laughs> we do. We do have time? Of course. Oh, we have time for questions. So we have a lot of questions, and the most popular one is about fake news. How the engines deal with wit and uh, distinguish fake from real? Yeah. So the, uh, very, very interesting question on fake news and real news. Two, two things to kind of say up front. Fake news of, of, of things being actually fake is a lot rarer than you think. If you, if you sort of look to the conversations, you think all of the news out there is fake. That's actually a very small component of it. What's actually much more common is saying, I'm going to make you focus on this thing that actually happened, but it's not really important. And so in San Francisco, where, where I live, there was a, a, there was a murder um, down on the waterfront. And it was by um, an immigrant um, that uh, allegedly fired a gun and killed someone. That was ruled to be um, an accident. But the story was told there was an immigrant that came, a bad man, as, 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 as a certain president might say, a bad hombre, um, terrible. And that became the story. And alleged murder became a national story. Should we have, did that really happen? Yeah, it did. Someone died. Is that the thing we should have focused on? That becomes the bigger question. So I, I think when we think about fake news, I think it's better framed as what should we focus on of all the things that we could focus on? What should we focus on? When you are looking at fake news, what you're really looking at is manipulation. So manipulation can happen with real events, it can happen with fake events. And so how do you detect manipulation? And that's something that we spend a lot of time with. And manipulation is really looking at who wants you to believe this. And so when you look at that, one of the things you start looking at is saying, well, we can't really detect if it's real or fake based on what's said. We can't really detect if it's real or fake based on um, you know, an underlying ground truth. But what we can detect is the networks of bots that start to disseminate this information. And so if you want to start doing this, you start looking for who's spreading the information. And the networks of bots look very, very different from the networks of humans. And what's interesting about humans is they start to then replicate what the bots have said, and at that point it's escaped. So you've got to trace it back to the networks of bots. But I'd also kind of say is, is, is that fake news also has a very interesting angle, particularly from a, an intelligence perspective. 
it's very interesting if your opponent wants you to believe this. And you don't necessarily want to ignore that. You want to understand what they want you to believe and why they want you to believe it. And look, you know, with both Chinese and Russian media, I don't think it's any surprise that a lot of stuff there has got a, a different purpose behind it. So understanding what that purpose is is really important. But what I would say at the end of this, you can absolutely detect bot networks. You can detect when there's manipulation. You struggle somewhat to figure out if the information that they're spreading is real or fake. And you know, the best science at the moment on that is performing a little bit better than random, but not much. There is another provocative question. Could you generate text or news that logically adds up and factually checks out, but the conclusion is leaned in your desired direction? Yeah, so it's interesting. One of the things we roll out these um, technologies to different organizations um, around the world, and we have our system um, train on, on the things that are being produced by the, uh, the analysts. Um, and so it's interesting. What, what it actually does, if you do that without any kind of other grounding, is it picks up a bias of what those analysts already think about the world. So one of the things there is, is you know, we go to some of these organizations, and uh, they're all focused, let's say, very, very focused on a competitor or a particular region. And they shouldn't be. And what we have from the managers come back and they say, I don't want, I don't want the reports that are generated to focus on that so much. And so one of the interesting things that comes back is you say, well, a machine can learn about what it thinks are important in the world, and that may disagree from the objectives of the people um, managing the people who are consuming that information. And so it comes down to this, this sort of dynamic of like, what's really important in the world, and how do we know what's important? And that is where you start saying, well, look, we can identify what's going on, but the next step is to figure out what's really significant. And if you can figure out what's significant, then your game is to help people understand it. But it's certainly not a straightforward kind of task <laughs> to, to figure out when, when, where you should focus on one thing and not another. A practical question. Are you planning any publicly available tools, let's say news summaries, academic research area summaries, and so on? Yeah, look, we, we started um, this with, with the sort of the goal of can you replicate the, uh, the opening chapter of a PhD thesis. Um, or some of it. So there's a bunch of PhDs, of course, what do you do? He's like, well, we should write PhD thesis. Um, <laughs> and so that was where we started our thing. And so we actually produced, um, a, so actually a pretty passable uh, first chapter, um, the literature review, the major players, the topics and themes, the key papers. Um, and so we've been using that internally, actually, inside of the team to keep track of all the research around computation and language. Um, but also I use it to keep um, up to date on cryptography, um, also dive into things like information retrieval, which is fascinating. I want to be able to kind of get that um, out and available to a large number of people. Um, and so, you know, hit me up if you want to be a beta tester on that. We'd love to kind of get that into your hands and get, get some feedback. We will look towards a, a release um, of the science-based academic product um, probably uh, in the second half of this year. But we'd love to get anyone um, who's interested in kind of keeping up to date on this stuff, drop me an email and we'll get you on the beta program. Thank you. Thank you.